He talked about Sunil a couple of times. I am Sunil, by the way. I forgot to introduce myself in the beginning. I have a background in insurance, uh, banking, technology, Falana, Dimka, whatever. Doesn't matter. I'm here as in my own capacity. Uh, you chucked your presentation, looked at the audience, and went extempo. That was priceless. Give him another round of applause for that. My takeaways were cash agnosticism. I have to still digest that. Identity, privacy, security, interoperability. And you work with startups. I mean, I didn't know that. That was very impressive. My next speaker, I mean, our next speaker is uh, Jerry Gupta. He's the senior vice president of Swiss Re. Uh, Jerry is a guy, you know, uh, from what little I know of him, he likes to overcome failure. So, which means this guy is uh, somebody who goes tinker around, works, and then learns how to get around it. That's what I get from it, as far as startups are concerned, right? Uh, he's uh, somebody who drives change, and not just change, but real change, grassroots change, societal change. That's his end objective, actually. He's a thought leader on everything digital, uh, creates delightful customer experience. I love that, because most people, I think most businesses exist just as businesses, and they forget they exist because of the customer. Sits on the intersection of data, technology, business, takes idea from concept to market with full stack program management expertise. To talk more about all that, please welcome Jerry Gupta. Yes. Based on the current churn rate. That's the reality companies are facing today. And if you look at this chart, you can see the pace of acceleration in, in technology is really accelerating, pace of change. <coughs> Individuals are not able to keep up, and more importantly, businesses are not able to keep up. And what that is doing is it's creating a vacuum. Companies cannot rely on core competence, companies cannot rely on brand, companies cannot rely on the incumbent advantage because they are not able to keep up with the customer's needs. Not surprisingly, when you talk to industry professionals, they say digital innovation, change, is the primary need. They also list that as one of their biggest gaps. But if you ask them how do they want to do it, they don't have an answer. We have done study after study after study. We have done research after research after research. And the answers are relatively simple. We call it PET, create a digital strategy which gives people permission to change. Culture of experimentation agility. Create an environment that allows them to do the kind of things they need to do. And finally, talent. You've got to hire people who challenge you, hire people who are different from you, hire people who bring different perspectives. Good morning. My name is Jerry Gupta. I'm part of Swiss Re. We are a global insurance company, and I think you see our logos here, so it looks like we sponsored this. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about, uh, I, I've tailored a little bit to the India experience, and my colleague Ashish is sitting right here. Stand up. Acknowledge. He's the expert and, uh, when it comes to the uh, insurance experience in India, so feel free to ask him or me questions uh, after the presentation. So over the next 15 odd minutes, what I'll do is I'll take you through a digital transformation journey. I'll talk about the drivers of digital transformation. I'll talk about how it is impacting insurance. That's my background. That's my recent background. And then finally, I'll give you some frameworks that have been tried and tested. I used to work at Amazon. I used to work at Liberty Mutual. I used to work at uh, Accenture. So have the kind of experiential basis of research, study, as well as practical application where we think we bring some credibility to the market. So this is not a um, new slide. You have seen it. I'm sure other people have spoken about it. Kush spoke about the cashless economy, which is part of this. The trends that drive digitization are pretty well known. In India, there's a super envelope of that, which is Aadhaar. And then the result is a very exciting journey that we all embarked on, digitization. I was talking to Sunil before this presentation, and we talked about, is it exciting, is it scary? It's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. 
What does digitization result in? We don't quite know yet. What we do know is what the big tech are doing. Right. Companies like mine, companies which have been in business 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years, they think in terms of core competence. If you look at the big tech, they don't believe in core competence. They believe in customer engagement, customer experience. They will go anywhere, they will do anything that allows them to create a great customer experience. If you look at Google, Apple Pay, horizontal work, uh, vertical ecosystems. Amazon, vertical, but now with Amazon Pay, it's also horizontal vertical systems. And what this does is it creates a segregated world. The world is now divided into two. Those who have data, those who don't. And those who have data have a sustainable advantage of, over everyone else. They are rent seekers. We are all commodity who will need to utilize their data to provide our services. We are commodities, we are suppliers. They extract the value while we are simply suppliers that plug into your modular suppliers. So how do we as a, as a, uh, as, as a financial services industry, as insurance industry compete in that? Our view is financial services industry is at the greatest risk of disruption, disintermediation that results from this digital change. There are three aspects to it. The world is getting so complex, information is so abundant that we as human beings are starting to lose our ability to make sense out of it. That is resulting in overly simplistic solutions and for us as insurance and as finance industry, we have to make things simpler, not complex. Customer, exp customer experience is king. We had need to forget about products, services, customer experiences. Products and services are tools that create a customer engagement, customer experience. And finally, data. Data is king. In terms of how is it affecting insurance, right? I take inspiration from Rabindranath Tagore. He says, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free and words come out from the depth of truth, take my country awake. How does it impact, how does it relate to insurance? India has one of the largest middle classes on an absolute basis in the whole entire world. About 260 odd million projected to grow to 500 million within the next 10 years. This is huge. Their average income is, not the average, their, their income is $13,000 or higher on a PPP terms, close to $100,000, and they consume massive amount of services and products. India is also one of the, our household consumption is really high as well. We have this market that is facing micro risk on a daily basis which we are not addressing. We are selling insurance, so uh, those of us, those of you who don't know, but PNC insurance penetration is India is also one of the lowest. Why is that? We are selling insurance to a market that doesn't like the product. And we are saying the market is wrong. The market is never wrong. The product is not right. If McDonald's could adapt its burger for India, why can't insurance adapt its product for India? Micro insurance for micro risk for micro period. The middle class faces micro stress on a daily basis. Be it the driver they've hired, be it the nanny, be it the cook. Let's de-stress them. Let's achieve Tagore's vision. But the health is held high. The people who service this middle class can't make whole their client if they break something. If there is insurance, microinsurance, they can make them whole. That brings the dignity with it. They can hold their head high because they have not caused harm to the employer. All of this obviously requires trial streaming. Which way should I be pointing this? This way. Okay.
All right, there you go. So the thing about India is India, the Indian consumer is a value conscious consumer. Insurance, by its very definition, creates a mental accounting bias. Insurance means the many are subsidizing the few. It's a balance between risk transfer and value transfer. As long as the risk transfer is higher than the value being transferred, which is the perceived risk that you are offloading is higher than the premium you are paying, the market grows, expands, you get more customers. The minute that doesn't happen, you don't grow. And for the Indian context, in order to achieve that, we have to create the right use cases, and the products we create have to be simple and intuitive, and the customer should not feel that it is impinging his pocket. The Indian household, Indian consumer speak, feels, if I'm not driving my car and it's sitting in the garage, why should I pay insurance? It's a good thought. In business school, the textbooks that we have read, we still read, they're still geared towards the industrial age, the machine age. In the digital world, we need to throw those books away. We have to start fresh, start new. The way they describe distribution, you know, the four piece, it's omni-channel, you have to be everywhere. The product has to do everything. We have to be flex flexible, agile. And in terms of the, something just happened here. In terms of the product, customers are demanding personalized, customized experience and a product that caters to their specific needs. And just to put this in context, let's assume we create a product in the insurance industry called the temporary driver insurance. A few years ago, my parents bought a new car. My dad can't drive anymore, so we hired a driver. The driver came. He was, I would imagine he was 15, 16 years old. He was referred by a friend whom my parents trusted. And I said, doesn't look like he has the license to drive. He had a license. So I said, but how can, I mean, it doesn't look, how long has he driven? So we asked the, the person who referred and said, oh, you know, he's been driving, driving for the last two or three years. Yeah, they all come young. And yeah, he's had a couple of accidents, but he'll be okay. That's the experience we are living in. <coughs> what if we had an insurance product that covered the driver, right? In India, People buy the TP insurance, and then within three months, they let it go, and they are driving without insurance. But what if there was insurance for this? You only pay for what you drive. As you drive, because it's pay on, uh, usage based, you're collecting data. As you get more data, you can create new algorithms, better risk models. You can reduce your risk, reduce your cost. You can pass on the savings back to the customer, and then you create a virtuous cycle. Customer feels there's value transfer going on that is to their benefit. Think about it. And this can go on and on. There's so many micro risks that we face in India on a daily basis. We can alleviate a substantial number of those. Just an example of something out of the box. There's a company called Beam Dental. They have embedded IoT in a toothbrush. If you brush two times a day, every day, your dental premiums go down. Right? It's an out of the box thinking. Does it work? I don't know. But it encourages behavior that benefits everybody. It's a theoretical win-win situation. IoT usage base are not the only innovations going on in insurance. Parametric is another big one. We at Swiss Re have deployed a product called the delayed flight insurance. If your flight is delayed by more than 45 minutes, we pay you. We don't ask any questions because we have automated data feeds from airlines, travel agencies. You don't have to file a claim because within 72 hours, the money will be in your bank account. That's the future of insurance. IoT enables that, AI enables that. It's all focused on customer experience. It's all focused on alleviating those micro risks that we don't really worry about too much, but we think of it enough that if it's just a very small payment, you can say, huh, it's okay. <laughs> micro insurance for micro risks, for micro periods, micro cost.
The final piece is the, 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 some of the frameworks we have developed. And one of the frameworks that we have is called the EAT framework, which is we have to rethink economic value, we need to be agile, and we need to transform by mastering the rules of the digital economy. At an organizational level, at an industry level, these are absolute must. If we don't do that in the financial services industry, we will be disintermediated, we'll be disrupted. What does economic value mean? Used to be, we were either commodity seller, good sellers. As you go up the value chain, as the economy changes, you go from agrarian commodities to producers to goods to services. The new one is authenticity, experiences. If you're not rendering authentic experiences to the customer, the customers are walking away. They're going to companies who are providing overly simplistic experiences, but experiences that align with their expectations. Just to give an example, on the left is a company that says, we will provide customers with the most convenient access to the media entertainment. On the right is another company that says, we will grow and become the best global entertainment distribution services. Blockbuster. Did it follow its mission? Was it authentic? No. It could have gotten into digital distribution. It did not. It stayed in video distribution, out of business. The other one, obviously, is Netflix. Authenticity. It's telling customers what to expect of it, and it's delivering. Agility can be learned, right? I mean, in big businesses, we say, hey, we have processes, we have this, we have that. No, it can be learned. We have a framework, we call it the Vice Arc framework. Vision, incentives, capabilities, equipment, slash resources. At Liberty Mutual, we created an innovation framework. We said, we linked our innovation activities to the vision of the company, the metrics, the strategic initiatives were linked to innovation uh, initiatives. Key stakeholders had innovation metrics in their performance reviews, stakeholder alignment. We hired people from the outside who brought fresh perspectives, capabilities, and we created a sandbox environment to give them access to the tools and resources they needed to do to do their jobs. You can't just have that. You also need to have accountability. People should be made responsible for what they do and held accountable for the results. Reporting. The metrics need to be clear and defined, and then they need to be communicated in a manner that's easy, simple, timely. Transformation itself is not rocket science either. We know what the failure modes are. These are established failure modes. Research after research after research has shown these are the reasons why projects, companies, Startups fail. Not the right team is the most important. No business model. We create, sometimes we create projects because it's a, it's a, you know, some higher up said, this is something we should do and we do it. No customer feedback. How many of us do regular customer feedback when we create projects internally? We can manage transformation and de-risk it substantially. And finally, the PENS rules for digital projects, which is you, should not, you cannot create a product if there's no willingness to pay You haven't thought about customer engagement, customer experience. There is no unmet need, need customer feedback. And then the SIFT criteria. The SIFT criteria stands, in the digital world, a product can only succeed if it meets one of the four criteria. Simple, innovative, fast, transparent, and cost is part of transparent. If it does not meet one or more of those four criteria, don't bother launching it. It's not going to succeed. And finally, concluding. You know, d dedicated team with grit. When we hire people, when I hire people, one of the key criteria I look for is how have they overcome adversity? What challenges they have overcome? And so on and so forth. I realize I'm running really short of time, so I wanted to give a couple of minutes. Uh, so we have about two minutes uh, for you guys to ask any questions that you might have. Will you talk about uh, <coughs> IoT tracking uh, the various aspects of our, uh, so so it does become like a digital eye and it makes practically uh, makes anybody conscious of what we are doing even in, when it comes to something routine like driving, right? So so it's it's kind of a, a infringement on privacy in that sense, right? So I don't know how how that gets addressed in the larger scheme of things. Uh, if you could 
uh, you know, shed, your, shed light on that, please. So if you are disclosing what you're doing and the customer has given informed consent, the word is informed consent, he knows or she knows exactly what's happening, privacy doesn't apply, right? Fair, fair the, the benefit is going to the customer because he's getting a discounted, cheaper rate, there's behavior modification and the advantage of behavior modification are going back to the customer as well. Uh, fair enough. The only concern is that the only product available is this kind of product where I cannot buy insurance without giving that kind of consent. That is the concern. So we need to change that, right? It's, there it's wouldn't a, be an insurance which I can buy where I don't give a consent like this. That, you know, I, uh, uh, that every aspect of how I clap, press, press uh, the brakes and how I accelerate, Everything is watched. So if you look at if you look at the U.S. and the European experience, they are both coexisting, right? Even in the future, right? They will they will continue to coexist. One will not be done at the expense of the other. That's just not going to happen from a regulatory point of view. Yes. How much are they investing back into say if you are covered death? How much are you investing in prolonging that life? You are interested in the life, not in the death. So it also helps the consumer who is right. already. Right. He doesn't want to die. Right. But how much are you investing in that? You know, of the when you say investing as in investing in technology? Like so helping him to live longer, you know, healthy, longer, better. So, so there are a lot of technologies. Like that we I, I know about heaven life, you know. They okay. clearly put the intent out. Yeah. We're not interested in your death. We are interested in your long life. I think, uh, by and large, every insurance company, even health insurance companies, are interested in long life, right? So at Swiss Re, and again, Ashish can answer the question probably a little bit more detail later, uh, but we have worked with companies in India like Goki, which are, uh, which are focused on wellness, uh, uh, holistic health, and coaching and guidance and so forth. So I think this remains the holy grail for insurance companies where we want to be able to help people change their behavior and lead a healthier life. Uh, uh, how successful we have been. Uh, I think the use cases need to be better. Uh, having those big devices on your arm 24-7, I, I don't think it's a great use case. But I think, the, so we, we, we have what we call the battle of the wrist. I think, the, uh, you know, an Apple probably is going to take the lead with foldable screens and all those things. Your cell phone and your, and your iWatch are going to get merged. You don't have to carry two devices. Those will fundamentally alter uh, the, the health IoT and stuff like that. Excellent questions, actually, and I'm glad that people are actually thinking. Uh, you know, one thing is we buy f insurance a lot because we have fear, and insurance actually has been sold for fear, you know, for your child, children's plan. There is no such thing as a children's plan. The plan is yours. The beneficiary is the child. So they sell you on fear. Insurance should be <coughs> bought for freedom, I'd say, not for fear. You want to buy insurance because you want to feel free to do what you want. In fact, I'd like to see an insurance plan which says, Go to Lavasa, do skydiving, and you're covered. Exactly. That's exactly. the day I'm looking forward to, and that's what I think is usage-based. You know, you need, just need to have the data to populate it and be able to do it. I'd love to go on little more points, but we are behind time, so I'm going to move straight to the next place. Jerry, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Good round of applause. Thank you.